began as a dream marriage. He was a single dad, raising three children on his own. It was something that I was drawn to. Would end as a nightmare. Living with him was hell. Fearing for my life. What are you doing? Why are you sleeping in the same house with a killer? We went out and there's piles of dead ducks everywhere. As a terrified wife, must protect those most precious to her. She's definitely put herself in a difficult and potentially dangerous situation. What kind of man kills his own flesh and blood? My name is Aphrodite Jones. As a true crime author, I take on controversial cases. I track down the story behind the story, and I won't stop until I get the truth. New York's Finger Lakes. It's a region rich with vineyards, rolling countrysides, and farmland. I'm here in Romulus, New York, at the farm Carl and Cindy Carlson called home for more than 15 years. This is anything but a typical murder mystery. It's a story of family betrayal, where blood is much thinner than water. It's November 20th, 2008, a week before Thanksgiving, and one of those crisp fall afternoons upstate New York is known for. Cindy Carlson and her husband, Carl, are returning home. They've just had an emotional day attending a funeral for Cindy's aunt. Is that country music? The music is coming from the garage where Levi, Carl's 23-year-old son from her previous marriage, has been doing some work on Carl's truck. Levi and Carl's relationship has been troubled ever since Levi's teenage years. That's when Levi dropped out of high school and started immersing himself in the world of heavy metal music. You heard the country music and you thought, that's not Levi. Carl said, you know, something like, well, maybe he really is changing, you know? So I thought, okay, well, maybe he is. I knew he was changing his life. Exhausted, Cindy goes inside to see if her and Carl's younger son, Alex, is home from middle school. Carl went out to the garage to tell Levi. He said he's going to let Levi know we were home. I was in uh, just pure shock, kind of surreal, everything that happened, you know. And it was just chaos from there. 911, what's up next? You know your emergency? Yeah, uh, I'm at the 885 Yelp Farm Road. Okay. I think I need an ambulance. We just got home. The truck fell on my stepson, and I don't think he's alive. Carl had pulled Levi out from underneath the truck. Are you with your, your son right now? He's not alive. Is he, is he breathing? His chest is crushed. What did you see? Just by looking at Levi, I knew that he was gone. It's devastating. Horrible. Within minutes of Cindy's emotional 911 call, paramedics arrive on the scene and discover Levi's cold body. The nearly three-ton pickup truck appears to have fallen directly on Levi's chest, puncturing his lungs and suffocating him. Did you have any thoughts that, gee, if we had come home sooner from this funeral, we could have maybe saved him? I said, just total shock. Since Levi's death is ruled an accident, it's not routine for police to investigate or for an autopsy to be conducted. It appears the truck had slipped off the jack while Levi was working underneath it. Here's a young, vibrant man at that point. He was starting to get his life back together, right? Yes, I was very proud of him. That he was, um, I'm sorry. You're the only mother who really knew. Yes. I mean, people think- He called me, Mom. Of course. He was only seven years old when he came to you, right? In 1992, Cindy first met Levi's father, Carl. Carl's just moved back from California to New York and has landed a job at a stone quarry. Cindy's a waitress at a local diner. Are you ready? When you look at Carl, you can see he was a handsome man. It's easy to see how someone like Cindy could be drawn to him, especially when he opens up to her about his recent tragic past. We had a fire in the house, and uh, uh, me and the kids got out, but, but I'm like, oh, she didn't make it. Carl tells how a spilled can of kerosene led to the blaze. 
He was able to rescue his children, but the intense flames and choking smoke outside the bathroom his wife Christina was trapped in prevented him from getting to her in time. He was a single dad, raising three children on his own, and he was struggling with it. You gotta be the dad in. I felt sorry for him. You know, he lost this wife whom he adored. From the stories that I've heard about her, everybody liked Christina. It was a tragic loss for him to lose her. After just a few dates, Cindy realizes she wants to take care of this man and his family. Hi, Sarah. And this is Levi. Hi, Levi. He had three children. They didn't have a mother. It was something that I was drawn to. You wanted to be there for these kids, right? I took on the mother role of all three of the kids. Nine months later, they're married. Cindy loves being a stepmother. And after several years of trying, she and Carl finally have a child together. A son, Alex. You had thought you weren't maybe going to have a child, right? I definitely wanted a child. And we had to go through infertility treatments. And so when you had Alex, obviously it's a great joy for you, right? On the farm he bought from his grandparents, Carl and Cindy raised their four children and tend to Carl's prized Belgian horses. It's an idyllic life, on the surface. But the children's memories of that tragic day in California still weigh heavily on them, especially Levi. The trauma of losing his mom, um, he took it very hard. Carl told me that they blamed him for Christina dying. I took that to mean they were blaming him because he couldn't save her. Do they just want to blame their father because they've suffered this tremendous loss and there's no one else to blame? Children do that. Children reach out for a scapegoat, especially when they feel cheated, cheated out of a mother. As a teenager, Levi's anger and resentment over his father's inability to save his mother intensifies. And two years before Levi's death, things get physical. You want to take I'm not doing anything for you. What are you going to do about it? Huh? When traumatic events happen to children, those events become even larger in their mind. And so as an adult or young adult, the perspective shifts and you rewrite history. You could have saved her. They ended up getting into a wrestling match. I was yelling to Carl, just let him go. At the time, I just thought Levi was, you know, doing his rebellious thing that he had been going through. With so much turmoil at home, 17-year-old Levi finally moves out in the spring of 2002. Later that fall, he meets 17-year-old Cassie Hahn. Within less than a year, they marry and quickly have two daughters. But like a lot of teenage marriages, this one doesn't last. And after five years, they divorce. There's always a lot of drama with um, him and Cassie. It was the both of them. You know, neither one of them was nice to, you know, the other one. I think he wanted to finally stop the fighting with her and grow up and be a good dad to his daughters. This new beginning also gives Levi the impetus to get his GED and start repairing his relationship with his father. He had actually moved back in with us. I really saw a huge change in Levi. He tried to please his father. That's what he died doing. He was trying to please his father. He wanted his father's love. Yeah. It's even more difficult to think of Levi as somebody who was actually getting his life on track, who finally was seeing his way out of darkness when, bam, his life is cut short which only makes Levi's funeral that much more heartbreaking. As Carl and the rest of the family mourn Levi on November 26, 2008, a stranger approaches Cindy. He's an insurance agent, and he tells her that just two weeks before the accident, he met with Carl and Levi so that Levi could take out a life insurance policy. The agent tells Cindy that Carl had made the first payment for his son and made sure he and Cindy were named as the beneficiaries. Now, Carl's in a difficult situation. I don't think Carl ever had any intent to tell Cindy about this life insurance policy. He had no intentions to tell her when he was going to receive this money. To Cindy, the news comes as a surprise. 
A surprise that will soon give way to total shock. Coming up. I was worried that there wasn't going to be enough evidence and I was going to be made to feel like I was just this unhappy housewife. She looked like she was in her deathbed. I was getting ready for something big to come out of this woman's mouth. In late November 2008, Cindy Carlson is still grieving the loss of her stepson, Levi, who was crushed by his father's truck in what everyone believes was a horrible accident. But when Cindy finds out her husband encouraged Levi to take out a life insurance policy just days before his death, suspicion and doubt start to creep in. This money was supposedly for the grandchildren, for the girls. Correct. Should something happen to Levi? Since Levi's daughters are minors, and Levi's relationship with his ex-wife has been strained, Carl and Cindy are listed as the beneficiaries and receive more than $700,000. Carl immediately starts to strategize the best way to maximize his granddaughter's money before they reach 18. So let me try to get this straight. He had the money from Levi's death, and he was now going to take some of that money and try to make that money grow? Yes. And the idea Carl comes up with? I think I decided what we're going to do with the farm. What's I, that? I'm going to turn it into a, into a duck farm. What possessed him to go in the duck business to begin with? I don't get there it. There was a um, businessman from New York City that was looking for farmers in upstate New York to raise these gourmet ducks to sell to restaurants back in the city. Although funding this dream requires roughly $200,000 of startup capital, Cindy goes along with the idea, and soon they buy 5,000 Normandy ducks. Although many small businesses struggle to get off the ground, Carl is convinced his duck farm will be a success. Especially after he finds out he's going to be on TV. The Food Network of Canada had called and expressed interest in doing a show based on the duck business. He was in his glory. He was very excited about doing the show. But if Carl is optimistic, Cindy is realistic. It's been more than a year and the ducks aren't selling well. And with a shrinking bank account, tension in the marriage is growing. Was the duck business going under? It was going under. He was just sinking money um, into it, trying to save it. And did you confront him on it or say, what's going on? Or he kept saying, you got to put money into it. Um, first to be able to get any money out of it. In Carl's case, I think that he wanted fame because he believed that would bring him more money. Carl's excited when Pitchin' In airs in January of 2012. But unfortunately, even the good publicity of being on the show can't reverse the downward slide of the business. It's a harsh reality Carl can't accept. Equipment would show up at the house, and I would ask him where it came from, and he would say, oh, so-and-so gave it to me for, you know, helping him do this. And you didn't believe? I, no, I didn't buy it. Carl's pricey purchases, combined with hiding Levi's life insurance policy from Cindy, is only the beginning of his deception. He kept lying more and more, and I, I started realizing just how twisted his mind was and how not normal he seemed to be. What lies? Oh, he lied. Usually it was about money. To Carl, money meant status. He needed to feel like he was somebody. And it's not only their diminishing finances that trigger Cindy's fear. I started having these, the, the only way that I can describe it is, um, I, I call them panic attacks. I would have these thoughts that, you know, maybe Carl did this. Um, Killed his son. Yes. And then I would, you know, I'd be okay for a while again and, you know, think, Cindy, what are you doing? You know, you're crazy. The insurance company quickly paid out, and I knew that they don't normally pay out if they're, they think that there's foul play. Yeah. Plus, Carl and Levi had actually been getting along a lot better lately. Are you thinking, also, how could I go there? This is my husband, this is the father of my child. I, I wanted to believe that I was just going through some sort of breakdown. We've all done this. We have a gut feeling about something. But that gut feeling, we don't want to, we don't want to face it. 
I was worried that there wasn't going to be enough evidence and I was going to be made to feel like I was just this, you know, unhappy housewife out to get her husband and I'm just making this up. Unable to completely trust her instincts, Cindy decides to seek the advice of a private investigator. She hopes he can uncover evidence that might confirm her haunting thoughts. In October of 2011, Cindy meets with Steve Brown. To the PI, it's obvious that Cindy has a lot on her mind. She looked like she was on her deathbed. She kind of put her head down and she was getting glassy eyed. I was getting ready for something big to come out of this woman's mouth. Cindy drops the bombshell that until now, she's been keeping to herself. I think I'll get him. I think I'll push the him. What was Cindy's theory when she initially came to you? Based on Cindy's account, it was Carl's intention to go out there and, and push the truck off the jack. And she explained that day's events to me. What was key? The radio. We drove up. It was country music. Levi never listened to country music. She knew that, you know, obviously Levi listened to the heavy metal type bands, a Slayer, and things like that. So that that took her by surprise. It's amazing how one seemingly small detail can stay with someone and provoke such a response. Cindy can't stop wondering, did someone other than Levi turn on the country music? Perhaps to mask Levi's screams when the truck fell on him? It's hard because you want to look at the client in front of you to see if they're being honest and forthcoming with their information or if they're just being paranoid. Did you think she was paranoid? Um, I, I couldn't get a take on it. I wanted to see more. Cindy hands Steve a pile of Carl's files she managed to sneak out of the house including Levi's life insurance policy and the life insurance policy on Carl's first wife, Christina. Cindy had always been aware that Carl collected over $200,000 after Christina died in a tragic fire. Carl had explained to me that Christina's father had set up those policies. As Steve studies the documents, a very different story emerges. He tells Cindy the policy was not taken out by Christina's father, but by Carl. Even more troubling is when Carl took out the policy. The life insurance policy on Christina was taken out 12 days before she died in the fire, and the life insurance policy on Levi was taken out two weeks prior to his death. What was your reaction? Shock. You know, it was probably around these times that I became convinced that he had done it. Coming up, living with him was how? Fearing for my life. You go to the farm and it's a mess. I mean, it's like a bachelor party, just trash thrown out, ducks are dying, it's really, really falling apart. It's been three years since the accidental death of Cindy Carlson's stepson, Levi, and Cindy now has reason to suspect it was no accident. She believes her husband, Carl, murdered Levi, and possibly his first wife, too. Steve Brown, the P.I. Cindy's hired to build a case against her husband, has just followed a financial paper trail. It reveals a huge chunk of Levi's life insurance payout has been reinvested in two new insurance policies. Carl had a, a folder of the policies for the granddaughters. Each girl was, I believe, $250,000. So he's taking out $250,000 life insurance policies on a six and an eight year old? Yes. Yes. If something happened to the girls, he would be the beneficiary of whatever that dollar amount was. Who buys insurance policies on your granddaughters? I think Carl was a self-taught mastermind when it came to the field of insurance fraud. My granddaughters, you know, they very well could have been next. The girls have been living with their mom since Levi's death, but now when they visit the farm, Cindy won't let them out of her sight. Still living under the same roof with Carl, Cindy's afraid of confronting her husband directly given her suspicions of what he's capable of. But she still doesn't feel she has enough evidence to go to the police. You wanted to have some kind of proof. I want a con concrete proof to take um, to law enforcement. 
So together, Steve and Cindy come up with a plan. Steve will go undercover and befriend Carl in the hopes of deciphering what Carl's next steps might be. Cindy and I sat down and figured out ways that Carl would be trusting enough to have somebody come into his life. I said, well, I can approach him as a marketer to help market the stock business. And when Cindy tells Carl about this newfound opportunity, he agrees it's the perfect solution to turn the failing duck business around. His ears perked up. He said, absolutely, set the appointment up. She pretended to meet you for the first time. Yep, she opened the door and Carl was right there and handshake and smile firm. And um, I said, so tell me your vision. As Steve tours the farm, Carl shares his dream. Over there, I want to have a USDA butchering plant. That's going to cost X amount of dollars. Over there, I want to transform that barn into housing 10,000 ducks. That'll cost this. I would say, yep, that's doable. He was just getting very, very excited. But talk is cheap, and Steve soon realizes Carl doesn't have the money to back up his grandiose visions. So how much money do you think he actually lost on this duck business or threw away? Probably three to 400,000, roughly. I know that's a conservative number. We were getting concerned because he was, he was stressing about money. He was moving forward with a project that cost a lot of money. And he claimed to me that he was going to have the revenue, the funds to do that. Oh my God, he needs money? Where is he finding this money? Just the thought of what Carl could do starts taking a huge toll on Cindy. Are you sleeping with one eye open or what? My fear for my life at that time was that Carl would catch on to there was an investigation and him wanting to kill me too so that I wouldn't have anything to testify against. I just had to keep telling myself that it, um, I'm an actress, you know, it's, I have an acting job. This is the point where I'm saying, I want to shake this woman. Get out of the house. Get out of the house. What are you doing? Why are you sleeping in the same house with a killer? Finally, on April 29th, 2012, Cindy takes her son Alex and moves to a motel in Syracuse about 40 miles away. I didn't tell him that I was wanted a divorce. I told him that that's just going to be a trial separation. You go to the farm after she's gone and it's a mess. I mean, it's like a bachelor party, just trash thrown out, you know, ducks are dying. He couldn't afford to feed them, so what was he going to do? He just let them die. After I left, he just spiraled way out of control. How many dead ducks? Thousands. He burned some of them, and some he just let die. What in the world has this man done? I have nothing to say. He was getting desperate for money, asking for to get the granddaughters on his own. Cindy would call me, you know, upset and worried. How do I stop this? What do I say? I had told um, my granddaughter's mother. You know, I said, please do not let Carl take the girls on his own. My explanation to her was that he wasn't taking his medication. I said, I just don't trust that he would be able to um, get them on his own. Cassie buys Cindy's story about Carl not taking his pain medication, and she stops bringing the girls to the farm. Cindy knows she still has to be very careful about who she shares her suspicions with. But an unexpected phone call changes everything because somebody else knows what Cindy's been thinking. Coming up. The first time I actually had kind of that chill down the spine experience was when I saw the medical record. He said, how can you live with a murder? How could you sleep with a murder? For the past six months, Cindy Carlson has suspected her husband of murdering her stepson Levi and possibly his first wife. Unbeknownst to her, Lieutenant John Clear has quietly begun investigating Levi's death after receiving a tip about the case a few months earlier. He called Cindy into the station to hear her story. And she said, thank God you called. And I'm like, okay, now we, <laughs> sounds like this sounds promising. So uh, she said she had a lot to tell me. We spent that entire day interviewing her. After talking to her, we knew we had something. And that something is a theory Lieutenant Clear comes up with. 
He believes Carl engaged in a dangerous and possibly deadly pattern of actions that have enabled him to collect on insurance claims for years. For instance, Lieutenant Clear tells Cindy he looked into the horrible fire that engulfed their barn in 2002, which killed their prized Belgian horses. It's a fire Carl has never been charged with setting. Up to this point, Cindy had always believed it was an accident, but Lieutenant Clear now believes Carl may have set the blaze to collect on a $115,000 insurance payout. This brings the notion of playing with fire to a completely new level. The lieutenant then goes on to theorize what P.I. Steve Brown began to believe as well. The fire that killed Carl's first wife, Christina, back in California wasn't an accident either. Can anyone hear me? He believes Carl set it on purpose to collect on his wife's $200,000 life insurance policy. What stood out for us as being suspicious was the initial report of that fire, he gave very different versions of how that happened. Carl's version of the story, where he stars as the hero, is drastically different from what Lieutenant Clear and other investigators now believe really happened. Carl had always told Cindy he had no trouble rescuing his kids, but he couldn't get to Christina in time. The flames and smoke were too intense, and he couldn't get in from the outside since the bathroom's only window was nailed shut with plywood. Now, 21 years later, investigators believe Carl chose not to save his wife. Didn't Christina's father find a pickaxe that was leaning up against a tree right there? There's a there? pickaxe right there, but also Carl's truck was a construction truck filled with tools, ladders, and supplies that would have easily taken that plywood out. She was clearly screaming for help. Um, the children all heard their mom screaming for help, and he stood there just looking at the house. Made no attempt to take the board off the window. As for his mourning process, Carl moved with the kids to New York even before Christina was laid to rest. He never buys a tombstone. Even after the insurance money is paid, it's the family members out in California actually pitch in and eventually get a tombstone for Christina. He never does that. And by the time Carl received the $200,000 life insurance payout, nearly two years have passed since his first wife's death. And if Christina's death raises questions for Lieutenant Clear about what appears to him to be a dangerous pattern of behavior, what he discovers next makes him wonder just how calculating is Carl? The first time I actually had kind of that chill down the spine experience was when I saw the medical records for Levi. He's got a medical condition that causes his throat to spontaneously close and seize up. No insurance company in the world is going to give him that big a policy for a condition like that. And it's a condition Carl was well aware of. Nonetheless, on November 3rd, 2008, 17 days before Levi's death, Carl drives Levi into Seneca Falls to sign up for the life insurance policy. You, you got have life insurance. What if something happens to you? Am I right? Yeah. He's manipulative. It was on every level. Yes. Carl is the one that instigated these life insurance policies on Levi. Levi didn't do this. Carl lured him and manipulated him to do this. Levi was broke. He had no money to pay for it. And again, this another miraculous thing happens. Carl just happens to have a few hundred dollars cash in his pocket. To pay that first payment. To pay that first payment. Once he purchased that policy and made the first payment, he was tentatively covered until uh, the medical exam. Now, at, once the medical exam was given, the insurance company would have had the option of dropping it. But that medical exam, it never happens. Levi's physical was set up for the day after his death. So he died the day before his physical. Now, could that be coincidental? Yes, but we're starting to rack up a lot of coincidences here. And, um, and at that point, um, we were pretty sure we were on to something. Still, authorities don't think it's enough to convince a jury that Carl Carlson murdered his son. It's only circumstantial evidence. There had to be something, uh, an admission or a confession, to really make this a solid case. As investigators work to substantiate what their guts are telling them, Carl's desperately trying to save his marriage. He needs you. He needs me back. Well, he's sending her lots of text messages. She's forwarding those messages to us, and he's obviously trying to reconcile with her at that point. This actually gives Cindy some leverage to potentially collect the evidence they need. 
she buys a recording device. And you decide to go undercover on your own. I had let the sheriffs know um, that this was what, what I was going to do. I don't think we would have asked her, but once she offered, this is the one moment where he may have a weakness that we can exploit and, and, and get an admission here. To lure Carl in, Cindy tells him she'll consider getting back together, but only on one condition. I need to know everything. I said, I need you to come clean on everything that you've done in our marriage before I can even consider getting back with you. Carl agrees, and on November 13th, 2012, they meet at Parker's Bar and Grill, a popular lunch place in Geneva, New York. I don't think people realize how difficult it is to play a role and pull it off with your spouse. You've got to pull this off with the person who knows you better than anyone in the world. I thought if I could get him to confess um, about the barn fire, that it would at least show his character. Never in a million years did I dream that I would ever get him to confess about Levi. But it appears that's exactly what's about to happen. He said, if I confess to this, how can you live with a murder? How could you sleep with a murder? And I just basically said, you're sorry, right? You're sorry that, you know, you did this. Carl, I know you've changed. I know you've been working on that, and you must be having a lot of guilt. And I really want to be there for you. Cindy's words strike a chord with Carl. He begins to open up and reveal what really happened behind the garage door. So he said, I had asked him, you know, if the truck was hard to push, and he said, no, it wasn't. He had told me that he didn't set it up that way. I saw an opportunity, okay, and I took it. And he starts to confess to you, yes. And so he actually did confess to me. I went on to ask, you know, did Levi make a noise? And he said, no, he didn't think Levi was in pain. He said it was instant. He thought it was instant. Cindy can't believe what her husband of 18 years has just admitted to. But she keeps up her facade because she needs to know why Carl did it. Why? Why did you do it? I knew how to play his game. I knew that a way to get Carl to confess about this is to make him feel like a hero. Well, why did you do it? Did you do it for me? And of course he went with that. Yes, I did it for you because, you know, I thought back about all the times that Levi had been rebelling and had run away from home. Oh, so you killed Levi for me. Ah. Oh. That makes sense. Cindy and Lieutenant Clear finally have the proof they need to charge Carl with the murder of his own son. Or do they? Coming up... And so we'd like to talk to you. He said, okay. We said, well, don't you want to know why? He said, I know why. You want to talk to me about my dead wife and my dead son. You confess to your wife. I like my wife. What did you I'm just here. I mean, have a lawyer. Cindy Carlson has just heard a confession that shakes her to the core. Her husband has admitted on tape that he killed his son. Her worst fears now confirmed, Cindy meets with Lieutenant John Clear. I thought, this is it. We got him. That was his weak spot, and, and, and uh, you know, he went for it. The recording was not usable. You couldn't hear anything. We tried to have it enhanced. It just wasn't going to work. You can't really hear it because Carl had picked the restaurant that was very noisy in case I was recording. Without that recording, it's as if Carl's confession never happened. Now, can police risk having Cindy confront her husband again? They had asked me if I would meet with him again, but wear their wire and just try to get him to repeat everything that he had said. If, for whatever reason, he suspected that she was working with police. She's definitely put herself in, a, in, a, in a, a, a difficult and potentially dangerous situation. But there's no turning back. Just three days later, on August 16, 2012, Cindy meets Carl, this time at Abigail's, a quiet family restaurant Cindy selected. I didn't sleep much that night. We put four undercover officers in the dining room with her. Uh, wired her up with some good equipment so we could record and monitor the conversation. Part of me feels like I'm walking into a booby trap. Yeah, I can imagine you would feel that way. 
He says to you early on, I feel like I'm walking into a booby trap. Yes. Yeah. How did you handle that? I just reassured him that, you know, this is for me um, to get clarity of what happened. And if we're going to get back together, I have to have complete honesty. I said I took advantage of the situation as it happened. And that is exactly what it is. He actually does say to you, he saw it as an opportunity. Correct. What stood out to me the most is when he referred to the death of his son as an opportunity. I knew that, and that was it. With this recording, they finally have enough evidence to bring Carl in for questioning. I said, we'd like to talk to you. He said, okay. And we said, well, don't you want to know why? And he said, I know why. You want to talk to me about my dead wife and my dead son. We came back to the interview room where it's recorded and read him his rights, and he agreed to talk. During the interrogation, Carl maintains that Levi was still alive when he left. No, I did not kill my son. What we know to be true is you pushed that power over. I did not. Now, I here's did. the thing. You confessed to your wife. I lied Period. to my wife. No, what did I say? Are we sure? Are you have a wire? And we are, yes, we do. I thought it's, he did. It's all recorded. After Carl learns his confession to Cindy was taped, his story suddenly changes. The greatest thing about Carl's interviews is he can't keep a lie. When you lie, you tell multiple lies to cover a lie, and many, many more lies to cover those lies. You're afraid to tell us what really yeah. happened. I did not kill him. There's no way I could have. But he was dead when I went in there. Okay. Tell us about that. <laughs> we didn't credit him. It was a long interview, it was nine and a half hours. About halfway through, he comes up with a different version of what happened. But only after this clever officer changes his tactics. Professionally, I admire your, 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 yeah, your constitution here. You're, you're a strong man. What ultimately worked was appealing to that ego, because he has a big one. At one point in the interview, I told him I admired him, that he fooled us for four years. And he seemed to like that. You're that close, man. You're close. Come on. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. Was it just a split second thing? Jeff would come in and, and confront him on things, and then I would give him support. You walked away, you didn't run for help. I just... You didn't think 911 was I just... You couldn't jack it back I knew, up. The, I knew the truck was completely on him. The jack was falling <clears throat> fall over. I just knew that in my head that all I could do was run. But did you know he died of suffocation because his lung was collapsed and if the truck was lifted off and he would have been able to breathe? I don't know. And walking away from someone when they're dying can be a felony. In legal terms, it's called depraved indifference. In New York State, it's equal to murder in the second degree. On November 24, 2012, Carl is charged with second degree murder. Investigators soon pieced together how things likely unfolded between Carl and Levi that November afternoon. Carl jacked up in a certain way, had his son underneath that vehicle in a certain way. He walked over to the radio that was playing country music, turned it on, and turned the volume up almost on full, pushes the vehicle over on Levi. He leaves his son pinned on the truck, doesn't check on him to see if he's dead, doesn't make any effort to help, gets in the car with his wife, Cindy, and drives. On November 6, 2013, the day his trial is set to begin, Carl surprises his family by pleading guilty. He's sentenced to 15 years to life for second-degree murder. As part of the plea deal, charges of insurance fraud are dropped. But in subsequent letters Carl has written to me, he says he didn't murder Levi and felt forced to take the plea deal. The fact that he was able to cop a plea deal for second degree murder and only have a 15 years to life sentence to face is abominable. For Carl's children, the outcome is bittersweet. They've been waiting for justice in their mother's case for over 20 years. We view this as two murder investigations that we had a responsibility to bring do justice for Christina and her family as well as Levi and his family. And that responsibility could one day be a reality. On August 31st, 2014, prosecutors in Calaveras County, California, charged Carl with first-degree murder in the death of his wife.